Bro. From Brazil. <laughs> Okay, this is Rachel Rachel. Today's Thursday. I can mark down for Wednesday. Okay. You are Rivka Ram. Ram. Ram means very high. Avram is the father of the highest wisdom. Avram, the master of the highest wisdom. Shoshana. Chosid. Yes. Shoshana Chosid. And it's from Montreal. Yes. Patia Say again, Patia. Patia. <clears throat> Mrs. Shapiro. Mrs. Shapiro. I thought so. Closing in on this. Beth Shapiro. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you from, Mrs. Shapiro? Um. I moved from Crown Heights three years ago while I'm in California. You've been here for three years now? Sure. Do you like it? Yes and no. <laughs> I like the Jewish part. It's difficult because I never lived in a city before. I moved from a small town in California. Small town? Well, yeah. Um, it's you know, like Beverly Hills. No, it was like 50 miles north of uh, yeah, Beverly Hills. It's not small. Uh, 50 miles north of LA. Camarillo. Camarillo. Well, that's wine country. Rabbi Lang. <coughs> Rabbi, Rabbi Muchnik. Right, but we have Rabbi Lang. Lang. Sir, Ariel Lang. Rabbi Lovely young man. He's a lady. Okay, Mr. Shapiro from Camarillo. This is Hana Rachel Hana. No? No. This is Ruman. Uh, Hana Ruman, yeah. right? <coughs> like in Romania, Romania. And Rachel O'Connor. That's Rachel. Did someone see Rachel Hana? Yeah, That's also we have two Reb Rachel and Rachel Khan. <coughs> Nadia. Where's Nadia? Nadia is in a different class. She was in the summer. <coughs> Rachel Khan. Here we are. Tahir. Okay. <clears throat> Where are all the timers? They're on the top shelf. Oh, the black cover, okay. <clears throat> should, we, should we get times? What's your name, young lady? Chaya Atkins. Okay, so we've covered the first, does anybody remember to check what's going on upstairs this morning? Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
What color was the sky this morning? Let me show you a picture. Cloudy at seven. Cloudy at seven. Cloudy at seven. And we hope, we can hope that tonight there'll be a clear sky. We haven't had a clear sky all week. That means that we didn't really have a good, clear view of the moon to make Kiddush Lavana. Kiddush Lavana, the Jewish people, our calendar goes according to the moon, and the Jewish people are compared to the moon. And it's a very important thing. Every month we, we say a blessing, thanking Hashem for the moon, for the light of the moon, for the creation, everything goes along with it. And the, the bringing, coming of Moshiach is connected with the moon because the, the moon renews and restores itself every single month, just like the Jewish people. But we have to see the moon in order to say the blessing on it. And we haven't had a moon all week. And time is running out because we say the blessing on the moon when it's growing. Some people say it after, but we try not to. Try and say it before it reaches its, its completeness and its fullness. So we can, we're hoping for a full moon tonight to be able to, to bless the moon and the, and the month and everything that's in it. And we have to understand just one principle I want to go over before we plunge into the study of Tanya, which is the whole idea of the giving of the Torah, is fundamental to understand that the Torah was given at Har Sinai, 49 days after the Jews left Egypt, at seven weeks after, after we left Egypt. We gathered at Mount Sinai and with signs and wonders and weird miracles that we know about, that were witnessed by the whole nation. Hashem gave the Torah to the Jewish people. And nobody ever rose up and said it's a hoax. There were millions of people there. Nobody said it was a hoax until came a new kind of anti-Semitism from the 18th century, the 1700s, 1800s, which was the beginnings of the uh, so-called Enlightenment. When they began to say that the Torah was not given at Mount Sinai, was not given by God, even have great scholars from the non-Jewish secular world saying it was just made up in the desert by a bunch of rabbis, and you can believe that as a scholarly statement. And we were speaking yesterday about how it was given, what was it like before it was given? Well, when obviously it seems to indicate that the Torah was around before the world was. How can we say that? How can there be a Torah before there's a world? Well, the sages say, our, that is to say, it's, our, it's the, the, the inherited knowledge of our people. That we, we, we know this, that when Hashem created the world, it's like an architect looks into a blueprint and builds a building. First, he has to have the plan of the building. You can't just begin building without an accurate plan. It happened to my brother, it happened to a lot of people where the contractor didn't follow the blueprint. My brother, Oliver Sholem, once made an extension to his house and the thing got up and the window was in the wrong place. Had to tear down the wall and rebuild it. So in order to, to avoid such a thing, Hashem also had a plan for the creation of the world. And he looked into his plan and followed his plan. And, and, and the, that plan of the world is called, called the Torah. You say, well, how could that be? What, how could there be a Torah before the Torah was given? We just said the body of the Torah is a scroll 
a scroll with letters made out of ink, certain kinds of substances in it so that the ink will stay and not be erasable. And exactly so many letters and on so many lines and the lines have to be made on parchment and the parchment has to be drawn with, by scraping lines into the parchment to write on, everything exact physically. How could you have a Torah when you don't have all these physical things? So the, the, the sages tell us that this is part of the medrash. We're going to talk what's medrash in a minute. That I said a lot yesterday that when Moshe Rabbeinu went up on Har Sinai, he entered into a heavenly realm and there he perceived which no prophet ever perceived this before. There was God, Hashem was writing the Torah with letters of black fire on a parchment of white fire. And this is all a metaphor. This is a, how can we express such a concept that the Torah pre-existed creation? Well, we can't, we don't have words to express it. We don't know what it's about. So this medrash is really a metaphor. You know what a metaphor is? A metaphor is an image of something that we cannot understand, but we can understand the image. It's like, it's a comparison. In Hebrew, the word for it is moshel. It's a moshel. A moshel means Uh, a comparison, a story, a metaphor. It has its own life and its own set of details, but it's about something else. It's about something much higher that's too high for us to understand. So we need a marshal to understand it. Are you with me? The Torah is the first of all mushals, the mushal akadmoni, the ancient mushal, the prime primeval mushal, is the Torah itself. Now, a mushal, which is a comparison, must have the thing that it's talking about. That's called a limshal. So we have a marshal, and we have a nimshal. The nimshal is, this is the essential thing itself, is the nimshal, that's what the marshal is about. The marshal is about this nimshal, but we can't understand the nimshal, it's too high. It's too abstract. It's too remote from our own awareness and experience. We can't deal with it. And why is that so? Because the nimshal is infinite. It's infiniteness. Hashem, by definition, is infinite. He's not limited by time. He's not limited by space. He, be, he comes before time. He comes before space. So he is the the marshal of all, he is the nimshal of all nimsholim. He is the ultimate nimshal. And the Torah itself is the ultimate marshal. Because the Torah is about Hashem. Now we were speaking about what is the Torah. The Torah, we said, is a physical body made up of letters, made up of uh, instructions. The word Torah also means, has two roots. The word Torah has two roots to it. One is instruction, which in Hebrew is Torah. Torah means instruction. It's a book of instruction, it's a guidebook. You know what they say about the office supply? They got such a fancy new uh, fax machine in the office. It could do everything. It could even make scrambled eggs. But there's a note attached to it. Before using this machine, please read the instructions. 
every office gets a new machine. Everybody begins to play with it, and they don't know what to do. Okay, so that's the first meaning of the word Torah is instruction. But there's a second root of the word Torah, which is or. And or means light. In other words, every detail of the Torah is a source of light. And light is compared to knowledge and understanding. It enlightens our way. And it enlightens our spirit. And it shines in our minds. And when we learn Torah, it shines in our eyes. <coughs> this happens. It shines in our eyes. Are you here? You with me? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> now everything has a now. The forms that the Torah takes, the Torah is very brief. Ah, it seems to be very long, but it's not. It's really very brief. Every sentence, every idea in the Torah contains many, many, many ideas. A wealth, an infinite wealth of ideas. To understand what these ideas mean, and what are we supposed to do about them? What do they teach us? What is, how do they instruct us? We need a whole set of explanation called the oral Torah. And the oral Torah has many parts to it. So we have the written Torah, which we spoke about yesterday, which is all these letters written on the scroll. And we have the oral Torah, which is its explanation. Without the oral Torah, we don't know what to do. There's no way we could understand what we're supposed to do. When I was a child, Many of you also had the same experience. If you went to any kind of religious school, they taught you the Shema. And it resonates with you forever and ever. Even if it was a Reformation school, uh, a school where they pray to whom it may concern, they had no real set of beliefs, but they taught you the Shema that's embedded in your childhood. Awareness that this is your relationship to, to truth and to Judaism. Now let's take that. It says you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. What am I, how am I supposed to do that? I don't know yet. You shall teach, and these words which I command you today should be upon your heart. How do I do that? You should teach them diligently to your children. Okay, okay, I have to te teach my children. And you should speak about them. What am I supposed to say? When am I supposed to do this? When you're sitting at home, okay, when you go out somewhere, when you lie down at night, when you get up in the morning and you should write them on the doorpost of you tie them for a sign upon your hand and put them up over your eyes. What's all that? What am I supposed to do? How do I put words on my hand and over my eyes? So I need to have, and you should write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Okay, we know that. It's the Shema. What does it mean? So we need a whole body of explanation to explain to us each of these terms what they mean. For instance, you should take these words and write them down. Which words? Well, these exact words, this paragraph of the Shema, we should write it down where, on what? On parchment. Also, just like a Torah. Yes, it has the holiness of a Torah. What do I do with it? I'm going to roll it up and I'm going to put it in a, a case. And I'm going to put it on the doorpost of my house. Um, which doorpost? Which doorpost? 
How am I supposed, am I supposed to take a pen and write these words on the doorpost? Uh, do I write them on every doorpost? Which side of the door, if I have two doorposts, two sides, do I, which side do I write it on? The right side, the left side. Where is it? Doorpost could be six, seven, eight feet tall, 10 feet tall. Where do I put it? Do I put it at my eye level? Do I put it higher than eye level, lower than eye level? Where does it go? I once checked a, a mezuzah on a person's door. He yeah, said that I could check it. I took it down. There was in there a photocopy of, on paper, from a fact, from a copy machine of the Ten Commandments. Well, that's not that's not these words. So these words are the words you should write write them down, not photocopy them. You should write them. Uh, I had just heard a story two days ago. I heard this story. A girl went on a birthright trip to Israel and uh, in fact affected her. She, when she came back to America, she was going to college. She decided, calls up her father. She said, Dad, I need a mezuzah for my door. I want you to come my, and, and, and put it up. Will you come put it up for me? He says, yes, darling. Be happy to. He comes over and she shows him that she bought a beautiful mezuzah case in Israel. This happened this, this week. The story's hot off the press. So he says, you want me to put this up? She says, yes. He says, she, no, she says to him, where's the mezuzah? I asked you to come put up the mezuzah. He says, what do you mean? What, do you, what have you got there? She says, I got a mezuzah case here. Where's the mezuzah? I thought you would bring the mezuzah. I didn't know about that, he says. Where can I get a mezuzah? So he was, he is, in fact, the best friend of the Hillel director of all the Hillels in America. And maybe they're in a spa from, from Los Angeles, I don't know. But he calls him up, he says, I need a mezuzah right away from my daughter's dorm. I don't have one. Well, who might have one? Well, call your local rabbi. He calls a local rabbi. Do you have a mezuzah? No. He calls and calls and calls and calls and calls and exhausts all the rabbinical um, personalities that he, that he can think of, and no one has a mezuzah. So without any, other, without <coughs> any choice, who does he finally call? He calls the local Chabad rabbi. You have a mezuzah? Yes. I need one right away. I'll be there in 20 minutes. <laughs> so the mezuzah has to be made to specification. And all these specifications are in the oral law. The written law just says you should write these words on the doorposts of your house. Can I take a piece of paper and write, copy them down? and write them on the doorpost of my house? No. Has written by a scribe who knows what he's doing. What kind of parchment, how is the parchment made? Parchment has to be made from the skin of a kosher animal. Has to be treated. And every letter of that paragraph has to be made exactly right. And it's not just that paragraph, by the way, because that paragraph appears in one parsha of the Torah, which we read about three weeks ago. And it contains a second paragraph, which is in the next parsha of the Torah, which we read the week after that. So there are two parshas that come together with the mezuzah. There's the Shema, and the, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, my, all your soul and all your might. And in the next paragraph, in these words, you should listen and take upon yourself all the mitzvahs of the Torah. So the first paragraph is about taking upon ourselves the kingdom of Hashem, that he is our, 
our God and the only God. And the second paragraph is taking upon ourselves the commitment to do all the mitzvahs. These are the two paragraphs of the Shema, preceded by the declaration of the unity of Hashem, which is the Shema itself. So we need the oral Torah to take to, to teach us all these details. Again, you shall write them, you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand. Well, nowadays it became the fad. Everybody, absolutely everybody, I hope you girls all arrived on stage. The boy in the oratory, a very nice boy, but he's actually, actually, he's absolutely covered in tattoos. Is that what it means that you should write these words upon your, or they should be upon your arm? No, that's not what it means. There was an Israeli boy in the army from a secular Israeli home who tattooed those words on his arm. And then he met a Chabad Chassid who put the tefillin on that arm and showed him what it was all about. I mean, obviously his heart was in the right place, just didn't know. Yes, Rucham. Um, can you buy a new mezuzah? What? When you buy a new mezuzah, can you immediately, or, or tefillin or, or anything, can you go and get it checked right after you buy it? Or is that considered unnecessary since we are supposed to like trust in, like can we trust our fellow Jew that created it? If he has a good reputation that it's fine and get it checked, you know, within that time period of getting well, it checked or? If you know the person that he's a God-fearing person, you could rely on it. But even if we didn't if want to rely on it, if you don't want to rely on it, so you take it to a sulfur and have a check. Okay. And that's it's a good. That's, that's a good okay. idea. That's okay. It's yeah. a yeah, sure. It's a good idea. Costs money. Right. But I mean, if you're going to put it in your budget, you know. Right. In the future. Now, I know a person. I know a person. He <laughs> took his <clears throat> to fill it to be checked before Rosh Hashanah to a reputable scribe and he took them back the following year to be checked and the scribe found that he didn't put the parshas into the tefillin he, somehow he forgot and the, the friend was so upset that meant for the whole year he had not fulfilled the mitzvah of tefillin what? yeah that he had meant to he said all the words that he was supposed to say but he didn't have the tefillin on so with really, according to the strict leather of the law, you, once you have a pair of tefillin and a mezuzah, you don't have to have it checked because we can rely on the fact that you didn't touch it. Mezuzahs were more careful to check them because they're more exposed to the elements. And But a God-fearing person will have his tefillin and mezuzah checked before Rosh Hashanah yearly. So what do you have to do again? What? What do you see a person can do like once he realized he forgot what man he's done? Yeah. What did he not do? What did, what did he do then? Yes. I don't know what he did then. But what, what did he say? He said, oh my goodness. So this is terrible. How do you do such a thing? Well, in general, when a person forgets to put on a pair of tefillin, well, people don't forget to put on tefillin, but in Chabad, we put on two pairs of tefillin. Rebbe asked that we should do it. It used to be that Hasidim, before they got married, would ask the Rebbe if they can put on, are they, do they have the merit to wear the second pair of tefillin? Because it's a very high principle. It, it requires a, a, a deeper commitment and preparation and so on. And then it can happen, a person doesn't have time, he's rushing off to an appointment and he gets very busy with the things of the world that he has to take care of. And if he didn't put on the second pair of right away, he could forget. You go through your whole day 
And then the next day you go to put on your second pair of tefillin, you say, oh my gosh, I didn't do the second pair of tefillin yesterday. So therefore, yours truly, your teacher, has a custom which I try and give over to my children, never to do anything before you put on the second pair of tefillin. And then what do you do if you forget? Well, if you don't put on the second pair of tefillin, it's like you didn't put on tefillin that day. So what are you supposed to do? So people have written into the Rebbe on a case like that and asked, what should I do? And generally the Rebbe would say, you have to learn the laws of tefillin very thoroughly and carefully and give a lot of charity. Because in the old days, when you made it, we did a transgression, you would bring a sin offering to the Holy Temple to atone for your, for your uh, mistake. And the sin offering costs a lot of money and effort to do it. So instead of that, we give money which we could live from, which is like an offering to charity. And to be very careful and to try to put on film with other people to make up for the fact that we didn't put on. Now, what are tefillin? What are tefillin? Your reform rabbi might tell you that it's enough, that it should be on your heart. These, this whole concept, the unity of, God, unity of God should be on your heart and it should be like bound to your hands that everything you're gonna do is going to be an expression of the unity of God. Well, that's a, that's a very uh, fine principle. However, it's not the mitzvah. You could say it's the inner meaning of the mitzvah, and they should be for a, a tefillin between your eyes. Well, where, where is that? Some, sometimes you see a person wearing his tefillin on his forehead like this, between his eyes. Some people who are misguided, they don't know what they're doing. It says between your eyes, they, 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 they leave it there. Well, it's not going to stay by itself. You have to have straps. They're going to hold it on. What kind of straps? Leather from a kosher animal. What color? Black. Not red or blue? No. It has to be black. Where should it be? It should be no lower down than your hairline. What about people who have no hair? People lose their hair. So they keep it at where the hairline used to be when they started. What if they start putting on children when they already have no hairline? Sometimes a boy is sick, he loses his hair, you know, takes, has to take chemo, he loses his hair soon. Put it right in the front where the hairline would have been, I guess. Between your eyes. Now, the word for tefillin, it says they should be for totophos between your eyes. What does the word totophos mean? What in the world are totophos? So I once asked a friend of mine who was a very smart person. He's not a rabbi, but he's very knowledgeable. And I asked him, what in the world is this word totophos? And how do we, it says they should be for a sign, you should bind them for a sign upon your arm. Okay, so that goes over your heart, and we tie it on, and we tie it on in a very specific way, and we make letters of the olive base with the straps that we tie, as we tie them on, and we tie them around on, 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 down the arm and around on, on the fingers. And there's certain things that we say when we're doing that. I can understand that, but what in the world are these totophos between your eyes? What are totophos? So Rashi says an extraordinary thing. Rashi says that the word totophos has a root from two, has root in two other languages. How can a Hebrew word have a root in two other languages? Well, uh, the way the explanation is that originally in the time before the flood, everybody in the world spoke one language says in the Torah, everybody spoke one language, but then they revolted against God and they built a tower to, to fight against God to prevent him from ever bringing a flood upon the world a second time. 
They're, they were going to fight against God. So Hashem confused them and changed their languages. So everybody spoke a different language and they couldn't get along. And that was the end of the tower. Okay. So as a result of that, we find roots for Hebrew words in other languages. So in the African language, you have the word tot, which means two. And in the second language, you have the word for word fos, which means two. And two and two is four. Everybody knows that. Two plus two is four. Well, the miss of Tfilin happens to be mentioned four times in the Torah. What a coincidence. And each of these paragraphs where the tefillin is mentioned, we write it on a separate scroll and we put them into the four compartments in the tefillin that we wear on the head. So that's totafos, the four compartments for the four paragraphs that mention tefillin. They all, these compartments, these paragraphs also mention two other fundamental principles we have to think about every day. One is the unity of God. That's in the Shema here with Israel. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. one. And there is no other. And the second con fundamental concept that we must think of every single day is that he took us out of Egypt. And like we say in the Haggadah, if he had not taken our ancestors out of Egypt, we and our children, our children's children would be Slaves in Egypt today, or as my teacher said to me when I was in yeshiva across the road, when I, when I first came to Chabad, I went across the road to Ladar Torah, and we had a teacher, and he said, if it wasn't for this day of Yud Beis Tammuz, which was the day of the liberation of the previous Rebbe from the, from the torture of, uh, when they, the, of the previous Rebbe, who was being tortured by the communists, who were killing off rabbis, like flies, right, left, and center. They, they tried their utmost to destroy Judaism, and they did a very good job of it, because we get a whole generation after 70 years who know nothing. They were given zero education. And, and, and anyway, I don't want to get too, too distracted about this, but he used to say it was not for this day of the 12th of Tammuz, when the previous Reb, Rebbe was liberated from prison, I, my father would have been a communist, and since children are more than their parents, I would have been a bigger communist. Instead, his father was a chassid, and he became a, uh, also a chassid, a teacher of many people like myself. So the same thing applies to the exodus from Egypt, which was is the liberation of the previous rabbi, is a repetition of the liberation of the whole Jewish people from bondage in Egypt. That's the second thing we have to know about when we say Shema and when we put on tefillin every day. So that's one meaning of the word totafos. And I said to my friend, I'm in the middle of a story, by the way, in case you forgot. I'm in, I said to my friend, what is the meaning of this word totafos? How do we know after all these thousands of years that we got it right? Maybe it was just made up somewhere along the line. That's what the reform rabbis say what the scholars of the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment came from Germany. That was intellectual anti-Semitism before the Holocaust, which was physical anti-Semitism, okay? So I said to them, how do we know that they are not correct? That this is just something that got made up and evolved through tradition down the line. And he just opened the Chumash and said, look, here is the translation of the Hebrew Bible, Torah, into Aramaic. This translation was written 2,000 years ago by a Roman who became Jewish. His name was Unclus. He was the nephew of the, 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 the Caesar, the ruler of Rome, the emperor of Rome. He was the nephew of the emperor. And he wrote this, he became a great scholar and obviously a very special neshama, he converted, he became Jewish, and he wrote this translation, and this translation has the holiness of Torah. It's, it's respected with utmost respect. 
and you, he opened this paragraph where it says, Totafos What does it say in the translation? It says, Tfilin. Totafos means Tfilin. That's the translation of Totafos. So it's a circular question. When I say, how do I know what Tfilin are? And it says in the Torah, Tfilin are Totafos. What in the world are Totafos? I look in the translation, Totafos are Tfilin. <laughs> Got me. I, I never had any questions about the, the, uh, the authenticity of our tradition. And our tradition extends to every single detail. Every detail of our life. And that's all part of the oral Torah. And you cannot discredit it. You cannot. So the first, the oral Torah has sanctity and holiness. It's like a king and a que queen. A king and a queen. I have to just check the time because you have no clock in this room. Make sure that we didn't go over the time limit yet. Oh, okay. Body time. Check this on track. Who has a question? Remind me, what's your first name again? Batya, yes, Batya. So, Tot is two in another language, and Fos is two in another language. So, Tot is two. In, in uh, one language, and fault is two in another language. So you say, is that why by feeling that? No, I said, no, that's just a hint. That just, that's just a hint of what feeling are really are, are all about. If you want to know what feeling are really all about, so we have the translation Aramaic, translation which says, totifos are tefillin. They should be for tefillin between your eyes. But we need the oral Torah to tell us, well, where between our eyes? Here, here, this side, that side. Right here. Yeah. That's between your eyes. <laughs> but you know where it's filling. <laughs> so it's so we, need, we need to have all these details conveyed to us, and they are myriad, tens of thousands of details that make up the oral Torah. And as new situations arise, the sages of the day apply the principles of earlier generations to this situation, and we get new laws that apply to situations that didn't exist before. For instance, you're not allowed to do work on Shabbos. Okay, you're not allowed to do any work on Shabbos. Israel became a country in 1948 and they developed a navy and uh, commerce, shipping things and, and taking passengers overseas. What are they supposed to do on Shabbos with a boat? So certain people said, well, the boat will run itself. Everything will go on automatic pilot. So therefore it's permissible to be in a boat that's gonna go on Shabbos. And it's not considered work. The Baba Chereba happen, happens to be an engineer. And he showed that it's absolutely impossible to, to be on a boat over Shabbos. And the boat is going because you're going to have to make adjustments. No matter how automatic the, the, it may be. So this becomes a whole area of discussion and debate and disagreement between the airlines and the shipping lines and the rabbinical authorities. Who's gonna win? Well, the Torah always wins. And that is how the oral law becomes applied to modern day situations. We take the fundamental principles and we apply them to the situation today. Okay, now the oral law we start off by saying everything has a body and a soul. The oral law, each law is a body of knowledge. It's a body of knowledge, and it's about things that we do with our body, actions. There's an old saying that's brought in the ethics of the fathers. Action is the main thing. But you can learn and learn and learn. But if you don't do it, you miss the point. You can learn all about the importance of charity. But if you don't give your hard-earned money away, you never did an act of the mitzvah of charity, which is like all the mitzvahs in, in the whole Torah, our form of charity. 
The main thing is what you do. That's the world of action. Then we have the world of speech, which is learning the Torah, saying the letters of the Torah, studying the Torah in out loud, like we're doing here, and knowing the Torah, knowledge of the Torah. That's ideas, the realm of ideas. So the realm of ideas is, in a way, like the spirit within the Torah. Now, we said everything has a body and has a soul. The body of the Torah, we said, is the history of our ancestors, right? Yeah, time. And the, the laws of our day-to-day -day life, our holidays and rituals, wasn't mentioned in class, our ethics and morals. The difference between right and wrong that Torah has given to the world. There have been whole societies based on totally immoral ideas, unethical ideas. Societies based on murder like we have seen and, and continue to see, where it becomes a principle of the society, genocide. So this is another aspect of the what the body of Torah is. The, it's a body of ideas that have defined for mankind the difference between right and wrong. And these are the commandments of the Torah that are incumbent on everybody, non-Jews and Jews alike. Okay. But still, we didn't find out what's the soul of the Torah. <clears throat> the soul of the Torah is the godliness that's in it. If every one of you girls would write a poem, about the autumn or about learning Torah or about 770 or about the Rebbe or about your community. If you wrote about something that was meaningful to you and we read these different poems, each one of them would be like a testimonial about yourself, about you, who you are, because you put yourself into your what you do. So Hashem puts himself into the book that he wrote, which is the Torah. And when we learn the Torah, we are connecting ourselves with Hashem. And that's the, the, the soul that's within the Torah is Hashem himself. And we mustn't ever allow ourselves to get lost in the details, the physical details of the body of the Torah and forget about the giver of the Torah, the life and spirit that's in it. Okay, is anybody whose name, what, what is your name, young lady? Yeah, yeah. Malka? Malka, okay. Mikaniva, is that right? Did I pronounce it properly? Is it Mika or Micha? Micha, like Michael. Yes. Okay. So, all this is introductory of, to define a little bit more different aspects of the oral Torah, and then we're going to continue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for